my goal is to go there, have fun, and to learn. I want to be the best version of myself every time I train. I want to get a little bit better every single time. Hello, everyone. It's episode 74 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Mr. Jeremiah Grossman. My name's Jeremy Lesniak, and I founded Whistlekick, and I'm also your host here for Martial Arts Radio. Whistlekick, as so many of you know already, makes the world's best sparring gear, as well as really great apparel and accessories, all for practitioners and fans of traditional martial arts. I'd like to welcome our new listeners and thank those of you checking us out again. If you're not familiar with our products, why don't you head on over to whistlekick.com and take a look at what we make. For example, our sparring gloves are pretty popular, and for quite a few reasons. We cut the wrist shorter so you can move your hand better, there's lots of ventilation, and they're double reinforced. Add to all that the more comfortable, durable foam we use in our protective gear, and you've got a pretty great glove. Now, if you want to see the show notes, those are on a whole different website, and that's whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. While you're over there, go ahead and sign up for the newsletter. We offer special content to subscribers, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. We only email a few times a month, and we never sell your information. Today's episode features our first conversation with someone who trains primarily in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Mr. Jeremiah Grossman started his martial arts training in other styles, but found his collar later when he switched. With the strong ties between BJJ and MMA, you might go into this episode thinking we're going to have a wholly different conversation than normal. But we didn't. Mr. Grossman is every bit the martial artist that our other guests have been, and I really enjoyed our conversation. But enough of me. Let's hear from our guest. Mr. Grossman, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you very much for having me. It's going to be a lot of fun. You are, I believe... Now, we're getting to the point where it's hard to remember everybody, but I think you're our first Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu guy. The first one? I think so. This is going to be, I have to, there's a lot to live up to. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps, perhaps. And of course, you know, we live in a time where I would say, unfortunately, most people associate Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu with the mixed martial arts world, which I know you do have some ties into that. But of course, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is a legitimate traditional martial art in its own right. So I'm looking forward to talking about all that. But let's start out, because you had to start somewhere before you could get to here. How did you get started in the martial arts? I, I, ironically, because, uh, well, I grew up kickboxing, but it wasn't like, you know, it was more of a, a ring kind of fighting style. And then I left combat sports for a long while, but I found my way back to it because I was a huge UFC fan back in the UFC, UFC one or two days. And uh, many years ago, I thought to myself, you know, I might one day want to take a cage fight. And all these guys are training this Brazilian jiu-jitsu stuff, and I have to, I have to learn it if I'm going to go do it. So that's kind of that's kind of how I found my way to Brazilian jiu-jitsu was by way of MMA rather than than the other way. Interesting. So what was it? You know, if you're talking UFC one, UFC two days, this was before everyone sort of became a bit homogenized. You know, like if if for anybody out there that that listens, you'd probably agree with me. Maybe you would agree with me, Mr. Grossman, that most of your high level competitors, they've got some jujitsu experience and, you know, then they've got their striking component, you know, they're kind of similar, but back in the early UFC days, they were really different. It would be a karate guy and a taekwondo guy and a BJJ guy. Why, what was it about the the Brazilian jiu-jitsu that attracted you. It, you know, it's, it is kind of interesting way back then. There was the very specific monikers. There was a taekwondo guy, a boxer guy, a ground fighter and things like that. And I remember back in the day, I don't think the name, the word or the phrase mixed martial arts or MMA ever came up. That was something that came later as people started mixing up the styles. And I guess, I guess if you look at it now, there's three, there's three ranges of fighting. You have fighting at distance and things like Muay Thai and boxing. You have clinch, judo, and wrestling. And then you have the ground, which is wrestling, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And everybody's so mixed. Everybody's a mixed martial artist, even though they might have a propensity for one or the other. Okay. So have you had any experience with anything at those other two ranges? Those judo, the boxing, 
uh, kickboxing er early on and then right. Brazilian Jiu Jitsu later. And over the last, you know, 15 years now, I've got a little bit of experience with, uh, I've done wrestling classes. I've done some judo classes. I'm by no means proficient, like the, like the black belts and like the judo black belts that I've come across where, you know, when they, they grab your gi with two hands, you're going for a ride. So I'm not as good as those guys. <laughs> so, uh, but, but yeah, I do have like, some experience with the other arts. Okay, great. So that gives us a little bit of context for who you are and how you got started, but, and I guess even why you got started. But let's take a step forward. We're all about stories here. It's pretty much everything that we do. We're set up to get you to tell your stories. But let's start on a high note. Tell us your best martial arts story. Oh, gosh, that's a good one. I th actually... You say step forward. I, for that one, I got to take a step back. And I think what from what I've told, because I had to write about it, my best story is how my first training class ever and what kept me training. Um, so I, as I mentioned earlier, so I was watching UFC and I was like, okay, I want to try a Brazilian jiu-jitsu class. And I went with a coworker of mine. And so we, we go take a Brazilian jiu-jitsu class. And if you've ever taken one... Um, you know, it's you do about 15, 20 minutes of warm ups. You do, you learn some moves, you do some drills, some techniques, and then you spar. Now, you have to imagine, like, I was in not terribly good shape way back then. I'm about six foot two. And at the time, I was probably around 300 pounds and uh, much different than today. And, you know, I got through the warm ups, just managed through it. And the first person uh, that the black belt there put me to spar with was a she had to be mid 40s late 40s at the time she was a purple belt and you know so it's a, it was a woman half my size twice twice my age and i thought that the instructor was like messing with me so i'm you know the the ego you know the macho guy you know kind of comes out and goes <laughs> i can't believe this okay i'm gonna take it easy on her you can't hurt a girl you know that sort of thing right and so i'm gonna go very light so i go for you know you shake hands and you go forward you start learning the etiquette and in the half second she kind of weaves herself under my arm gets onto my back and proceeds to choke me right and it was the first time i've ever experienced anything like this and i'm like i'm like <laughs> tapping like so fast with like both hands going and i'm 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 upset i'm scared i'm a, you know more upset than anything else like i was taking it easy on her and she takes advantage of me not cool i'm not gonna let this happen again so you know you start from the knees as always and you reset shake hands and i go forward harder same thing, just lifts an arm drag, goes right to my back and chokes me again. And I'm I'm sitting there, I'm like less angry and more stunned than anything else. And I'm and I okay, let's try this again and, and again. And 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 it's, this proceeds to happen over and over again. Same move over and over again for you know the two and a half minutes of stamina that I have in my body. And I could not do anything to this woman. I I was just upset, embarrassed, and anything else. Class ends, and I'm sitting there in my car at the parking lot going, thinking to myself, I have no idea what happened. I, I have to come back and, and keep training, if nothing else, be, to beat this woman. Because I can't go through my life as a macho guy thinking, you know, grandma here beat, beat me up. So I have, so that's like <laughs> keep, me, keep me coming back from multiple <laughs> classes. And uh, so I was taking about three, four classes a week, and it took me about a year and a half to actually uh, finally find a way to tap her. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one and uh we don't talk a lot about me on this show i, I had about three months of brazilian jiu-jitsu and and had slightly different but basically the same experience coming in i had a fair amount of martial arts background i'd done some judo i'd done some grappling and thought yeah i'll, I'll do okay i mean this is all new stuff but you know i'll start i won't be terrible at this and I was absolutely terrible. Everybody's everybody's terrible. It's, everybody's yeah. terrible. It's it's. Yeah. I once heard somebody describe it as uh, drowning and being repeatedly taught how to swim. <laughs> hmm, I like that. It's a good one. So, one of the things that we talk about here is how martial arts and martial arts training has had an impact on people's lives. Now, you've been training for a little while. Yep. <laughs> we don't have to put a number on it. If you want to, that you're, you're welcome oh, to. Something between 12 and 15 years now. So at least for okay. Brazilian jiu-jitsu. But if sure. Out of combat sports my whole life. Right. Okay. So let's, let's roll back. Let's roll back beyond jiu-jitsu. Let's roll back beyond kickboxing. 
And let's say that, you know, soccer had become your thing. How do you think your life would be different now? Oh, gosh. Oh, you know, honestly, probably not terribly different. I, I like sports a lot, you know, whether I was doing martial arts. I've you know played basketball. I've played Australian rules football through my 20s and things like that. If you took out the martial arts, I you know, I probably have different friend circles and, you know, different activities. You know what? In thinking about it, I'd probably be at least 20 to 30 percent different of a person. I don't know what that person would look like because um, now martial arts have been become, become such a big part of my life. But I think what, one of the things, it might have changed a lot of people around me. So, you know, I, I travel a lot for work. And one of the things I do is I, you know, I bring my gi with me everywhere I go. So I've trained in, you know, 50, maybe 100 different academies around the world. And I also have, I have three children and I, and, uh, they do Brazilian jiu-jitsu as well. So I teach them. So I think my relationship with a lot of different people around the world with my children would be a lot different. Um, it's probably less different for me. I'd be you know, a little bit different of a person, but not much. But I think I just, I would treat the world much differently. I would experience the world much differently. Can you expound about that last point a little bit? How, how would you treat the world differently? Well, you know, the way I, I say it kind of tongue in cheek, you know, it's like I get to travel the world, meet new people and fight them. You know, so that's, that's kind of a unique <laughs> kind of situation. If I played soccer, I wouldn't, I would get to compete against them. Maybe if I, you know, find pickup games in different parts of the world, but probably not. I mean, you know, again, as a traveling executive, you know, you, you, a lot of times, a lot of people are stuck in the hotel room gym. They don't get to go to the local academy and go spar with just some random people. And, uh, you know, like they say in the Matrix, you never truly know someone till you fight them. So I I've, I've, have fought and fought hard a number of people around the world, and I consider them friends. I've built up great relationships in a way I can't imagine whether it's soccer or anything else would ever be able to do. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's good stuff. So let's come back to reality. Let's let's bring you back. You've you've got all that martial arts experience. You have trained the world traveled the world. You've trained with all these wonderful people. But now reflect back on a time in your life where maybe things weren't quite so rosy. And tell us how your martial arts training or your experience was able to help you move past it. Oh man. Uh hmm. I think, you know, there's, I, I think the most difficult times, you know, everybody goes through family troubles, everybody goes through troubles at work, you know, things like that. And I think, you know, one of the times my job function at, a, at the company I started had to change, you know, dra drastically. <clears throat> and it required, you know, 18 months straight of, you know, 12, 14, 18 hour days, you know, seven days a week, nonstop. And, you know, just a very struggling time, just a lot of work, things to do, tr tough decisions. And it's just a grind. Not any one thing particularly about it was really, really hard, mentally taxing difficulty. It was just a million little tasks. And it, it's just a grind. You get up in the morning, you grind it out every single meeting, every single phone call. And you have to keep a good attitude about it because, you know, you're working with other people and, and they have to be upbeat and motivated as well. So it's a grind every single day and you have to keep your head, you have to keep motivated, you have to keep doing it. And that, you know, for me, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu ends up being uh, an exact replica of that. It's actually become good practice. You know, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, the learning curve is, you know, it's difficult because it's, you know, I look at it when I go to class, it's just 1% better every day. You know, one little move, one little detail, and it's really difficult to get any better, any faster than that. So you have to grind it out every single class, you know, what you're hot, you're tired, you're injured, you know, there's somebody on, on top of you, they're heavy, you're in pain, you might be injured and so forth, but you have to keep coming back. You can't get discouraged. You can't keep, you know, you can't be frustrated. You have to keep coming back and do it over and over over and over again. If you can persevere through that, you emerge a very different person and somebody that can go through and embrace that grind and come out at the other side and end up in a place that many other people can't possibly, will never reach or understand. I think that I could just take that last minute that you said and just chop everything else. And we could just put that out as the episode. That was, <laughs> that was so well articulated. And, and obviously you're talking about it from the perspective of what you know of your martial art. But I would say that that piece, that 1% better, 
I think that's probably really going to resonate for a lot of other people. I know it resonates for me. That makes a lot of sense. And you just explain things in a way that I don't think I've ever been able to about some of my training. So thank you for that. And uh, yeah, we always chop out quotes to go at the beginning of the episodes. And I'm pretty sure that this episode's quote is going to come from that piece. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so like you said, you've had a chance to travel a lot and really work with, with people all over. And I'm sure some of them have been, have been great. Hopefully most of them have been at least good to work with or fun. I'm sure you've had some, some duds, some people that you would rather you were not working with. I think we all have that experience yeah. from time to time, but who other than your direct instructors would you say has been the most influential on your martial arts? Oh, man. oh, that's a great question. So, uh, hmm. uh, let's see. I've, you know, a lot of people take different kinds of vacations. You know, they go and relax go to a far off beach somewhere. That's, that's not an option for me since I live in Hawaii. And so I get to go to the beach all the time. <laughs> but, so one of the, my last, one of my last vacations, it was a, it was a jujitsu tour, you know? So, uh, you know, I got to train, I went to Vegas and I trained with Forrest Griffin and Stefan Bonner, um, did grappling with them. That was amazing. Um, you know, for those that are into Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, I got to train with Hickson Gracie, Hannah Gracie, Cron Gracie, Hickson's son. And all these guys were, you know, I was, I would take, I would really think about the class before going in, not have too many expectations, but on areas of my, my game, weaknesses really that I wanted to focus on. And whether, whether, I, whatever I learned during that class, I would then, I would ask them separately, like, I'm having trouble in this area what do you got? And they would sit down, you know, with me and we'll go over some things. And I, you know, all those little experience, I don't know if it was any one particular person, um, in, at least in those guys that really stood out. But I think the one person that was really influential on me was actually somebody, uh, I guess I inspired to, to train is a uh, name is Chris Hoff. Um, he's from, we're from similar industries. We've never worked together, but we started doing these, uh, Brazilian jujitsu events, uh, at twice a year at, at different uh, conferences. And so I would get better. I would teach him moves. And then he lived on the other side of the country and, he would talk about his experience in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and he's a brown belt now. We, and we've, you know, slowly worked up uh, through, through the ranks. I met him when I was a blue belt. He he just got into it. And, uh, and now we've, we've trained a thousand times together, but he, you know, we were learned from each other. Sure. It's all, it's all in fun, but he, he, when he keeps training, I keep training. And I think that's a, has been a big influence on me. Wow. So, and for, for people that, that don't know your background or haven't read the show notes or anything yet, your, your industry, these conferences, these are not martial arts conferences, are they? Oh, right, right. So, uh, I'm, uh, I started a company a while back that does computer security, uh, to not put, I guess, too simple or fine a point on it. It's a company filled with, with hackers. Our job is to companies pay us to break into their systems to tell us where the problems are. And so, uh, you know, we're professional hackers, as it were. And in, around the industry, computer security industry, there's large computer security conferences where we get together and talk computer security stuff, tens of thousands of us. But that's, uh, that's the industry that we work in. What kind of parallels do you draw? Because as, as some of the folks know, and, and as you and I talked about briefly before the show, you know, my background, not quite in the security space, but is in technology. Would you draw any parallels between technology and, and specifically se computer security and combat? Uh, I think so, actually, because in computer security, while I my type of security is I simulate the bad guy. Our job is to try to break in somebody else's job to try to stop us, and we simulate that that activity. And then you know, so you have you know the the people who try to build secure systems, break secure systems, and the other people that try to to defend them, but. No matter what, when you're dealing with computer security, there's always the, you know, what you're protecting and there's always the adversary and try to figure out where the adversary's strengths are so you can counteract them. And that, and that relates directly to combat sports, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, I imagine whatever martial art, what are your strengths and what are the strengths and weaknesses of your adversary that you're likely to go, go uh, to go against? Are they bigger? Are they faster? Are they going to be more technical? How do they come at you? Do they come at you directly from the side? Are they going to strike? Are they going to kind of close the distance? And 
you know, the more experience you have in different martial arts and the more proficient you're at it, you're, you have your advantages and exploiting their weaknesses, the better that you'll, you'll be. And so I think it, it relates directly. So I'm always studying the adversary in my, in my you know, professional world. And then every time I'm sparring with somebody, I have two things going through my mind. One is what are the areas that I need to work on, you know, to address my own weaknesses. And I'm sizing them up going, what are, what are their skills? Are they bigger? Are they stronger? Are they going to be faster? Are they be more technical? And I, and I develop really quickly a battle strategy in my head for how I'm going to win this fight. Hmm. Yeah. There's, and then I think on the, the back side of that, after any kind of exchange, going back and reviewing your, your notes or, you know, what worked and what didn't and using that feedback to guide your training. Exactly right. Cause it's, you know, we spar, we train, it's not a fight, fight, the fight will happen later outside or whatever. And it's, it's very important to review how you did. Did you execute well? Did you throw out your game plan at the last second? And, uh, you know, one of the things I wish more academies have, including mine, is uh, maybe like a GoPro in there where if all the students can get access to the video of their of their match or the class and go back over it, you know, for 30 minutes after class or the next day or something like that. I think that'd be really cool. One of the most helpful things I've ever seen in any kind of a f fitness or exercise facility was at a gymnastics club that I used to train parkour at. And they had a big screen TV on the wall with a camera recording the main area on a seven second delay. Ah. So someone would do something, you know, whatever their routine was, or if they fell, you know, they could wait a couple seconds and look and they could watch what led up to it. That's very cool. Yeah. Yeah. And the technology, I mean, isn't that complicated, right? You know, it's pretty, pretty simple to, to implement. I'd like to see that more. One, one of the things that I've encouraged on some of the episodes of this show is that even though we are martial artists and, and traditional martial artists primarily, there's no reason we can't bring modern training techniques and modern equipment into helping us get better at traditional things. Uh, like every, I think every martial art must be able to evolve, you know, try new, try new ideas, strange as they may be, keep it works, throw out things that don't. And I see nothing wrong with that, and including tech. I mean, if, if technology can help us spot the weaknesses and allow us to focus, you know, and allow us to develop our strengths much faster, hey, let's do it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think a lot of, a lot of people that teach have feel, felt the frustration. I don't know if you work with children at all, but uh, especially kids, you tell them that they're not doing something right or they're doing something wrong. You're trying to help them and they don't believe you. <laughs> and and I've, I've even gone to my bag and pulled out my phone and recorded them and shown them. And then the light bulb comes on. Yep. Yeah. It's a little, it's difficult at times to step out of yourself and see yourself for the mistake that you made. So a lot of times you just need video evidence, you know, when, when you do that sort of thing. I've been, I've been, I've been training a lot of striking lately, uh, Muay Thai. And, you know, I'll, I'll drop my left hand. I'm going, I'm not dropping my left hand. I'm not, my instructor's telling me, no, you're, you're really dropping your left hand. I, and, you know, I had to catch myself on video once and go, oh, I am dropping my hand. It, it's like, it was kind of imperceptible to me because in my head, I'm doing the move correctly. But for whatever reason, what I see of myself in my head is not what, what my body is actually doing. Right. Right. And, you know, for years, a lot of instructors have recommended shadow boxing in front of a mirror. You know, kind of that low tech version of the same self assessment. Yeah, that video can provide. So you hinted at the beginning about competition, the the idea that maybe you would compete in in something, some kind of full contact events, and you said you you did kickboxing, but. Let's talk about it in terms of competition. Have have you been in the ring, and and if so, what have you done? Uh, not not in a MMA match or anything like that. Um, but I have done a, quite a number of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu events, and uh, I think in many ways those are every bit as uh, competitive and nerve wracking, nerve wracking as everything else. Um, you know, you're going there and you've trained really hard, or hopefully that you've done everything you you necessary to prepare so you can step in there and do well. And then that other person there is going to fight you every bit as hard as you're going to fight them. And, uh, you know, I've, I've won a lot of matches. I've lost a lot of matches. And, uh, and it's always a lot of fun. It's, it's actually, I, you know, I find it helpful to at least compete once or twice a year, even though if you're not really big into competition. Because, you know, at the end of the day, we're doing martial arts. And some people like the art of it. For me, it's a lot about self-defense. Yes, it's physical fitness. 
yes, it's discipline, it's a good workout, that sort of thing. But I, I like to do it primarily for uh, for self defense purposes and to get your your head in the right place. And so when you have to be able to practice when it's time to turn it on, when it's time to fight and win, competition helps simulate that in a in a safe place. And of course, you're there with your your other training partners, your teammates, and your instructor, and it's a lot of camaraderie going on there. But that's a great way, win or lose, to start to train your body and mind to turn on to fight when it's time to fight. Mm. It's a great point. Now, you said you've done Brazilian jiu-jitsu events. What's your your thought on going the MMA route? Because you know it sounded like that was some of the original inspiration for you. Um, it's something that I still probably I'm still probably I'm getting a little bit older now, so it's probably something I if I really wanted to do, it's something I could technically do and be okay at. Um, but right now, I'm just having fun. You know training and and getting better the guys that i train with regularly are really good so you know just being able to have the opportunity of training with a lot of local black belts big strong guys there that are also extremely technical it's you know it's, a lot of ways it's just a blessing you know it's not something that everybody gets to do and uh and if that opportunity comes well i'll take it that's it's kind of how i set my goals in life and i and i grind it out and i try to have fun in the process so um if i decide to take a cage match it'll be later and some, a place where i can get a where i can clear my life to really focus on that one because that's not one you want to take lightly on, or on a whim right i agree now we haven't really we've, we've mentioned some names some pretty big names especially for people that may dabble in the mma world or watch the ufc you've had the chance to train with some great people but if you could train with someone that you haven't be they living or dead who would you want to train with and why? Oh goodness. Oh gosh. I think we'd I have to like I think that answer there deserves some time. I like that some time to time to think about that one. Let's come back to sure. that one later in the episode. All right. I don't, All right. I we don't, can do that. I don't know. That's a great one. We can we can do that. <laughs> <laughs> I am gonna hold you to it though. I, I, I will put you on the spot I'll later have if I have to get them back in my head with every every other answer going, who would I like to train right. with? That's a great one. I don't know yet. Okay. How about movies? Are you a movie guy? Uh, yeah. You have any, have any favorite martial arts movies? Martial arts movies. You know what? Um, you know, this sounds going to sound a little cliche, but it's nonetheless true. And I'll explain a little bit more why. But it's got to be The Matrix because it crosses sci-fi, which I love, and and martial arts. There's not not a lot of Brazilian jiu-jitsu or ground fighting, of course, but still, the martial arts in that one is super cool. Some super good lines in there. I've already used one. You know, you never truly know someone until you fight them. So... And of course, there are hackers in there. It's sci-fi. It's hackers. It's martial arts. That's just like me all bottled up. So <laughs> <laughs> now I'm trying to I'm trying to do math. So that would have been that would have been around the time that you had started training Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Yeah. Right? What year was that? Maybe ninety one. Was it ninety eight or ninety nine? Something. It's probably ninety eight or ninety nine. So, somewhere around around the millennium, yeah. Uh, yeah, so it was probably a few, couple of years after that that I started training Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Um, but as far as like kickboxing and stuff, I've been doing that since I was like 14. Now, did that movie have any impact on you? I mean, because I'm, I'm going to guess, I don't know about you, but you know, I'm, I'm a self-professed nerd. You know, I've been a nerd my whole life. And that movie resonated for me on all those different levels as well you know the the martial arts aspect and and the the technology nerdy aspect did that potentially have any i guess i want to say influence did did that push you did you look at that movie and say maybe this maybe i want to go into kung fu or this striking <laughs> thing because obviously you didn't you know you 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 went in a different direction, but I'm just curious. Uh, not so much that movie. I think that movie influenced more my professional life with technology, hacking and things like that. And, uh, and less with martial arts. I think, you know, as far as television entertainment, that affected me more than anything else. It was just, it's just the UFC in general. You know, I, I still, I, you know, this weekend they had a fight with Frank Mir and, uh, and Mark Hunt. So I'm, I'm watching it, you know, watching the fight nights and the UFCs and things like I, I love it. I, I love watching it and following the sport. But I think for TV movies, it's more just entertainment rather than, I, I, I don't look at it for martial arts inspiration. That's just me. Do you have any favorite fighters in the UFC? 
Oh gosh. Uh, hmm. There's a, there's a, a, you know, it folks, this wasn't on the question list. I'm just kind of oh. throwing this at them oh. out of the blue. So. Oh, not at all. Um, you know, it's funny when I, you know, people always ask you, you know, when I watch a UFC fight, they'll ask me who I'm rooting for or whatever. You know, you know while I do have some fighters that I like and I, I've, I've met personally, I'm just mostly just looking for a good, a good performance out of both guys, a, a good fight. You know, watching, you know, how the technique, how the techniques and the, and the different styles match up and things like that. And uh, whether it goes quickly or goes fast, most of the time, I'm just really interested in a good fight. Um, but, uh, you know, he's retired now, but I, you know, really like Forrest Griffin a lot. I like when he fought. Um, I get to train with him uh, at least once a year now. And so he's a really cool guy, super big, strong, technical. So mixing it up with him is a, uh, is different where he's slightly bigger than I am. So that's a, uh, it makes for a good challenge. Um, let's see, but who like you know, a- active fighters, uh, active fight. Actually, he just, he just lost, but a still awesome guy is a uh, Frank Mir, uh, heavyweight. So, uh, I, I like that guy a lot, but definitely a big fan. Nice. Yeah. And, and, you know, I don't watch mixed martial arts a lot. You know, I enjoy it. I especially, enjoy the amateur stuff because i like you know people beating the tar out of each other and then hugging it out and saying (laughs) thanks thanks for helping me get better i really dig that part of it but yeah watching it watching people rise to the occasion hopefully they're a good match for each other and then seeing who's got the most grit or who trained harder you know that that's the part that i really enjoy you know i think i think that's in a lot of ways that's like why we like watching sports we like watching the excellence of it you know the struggle the challenges and the victories you know the overcoming of adversity but effectively just watching the excellence of the uh, of the competition i just think there's something in us that you know that we really like that we're really drawn to that sort of thing i would agree so how about martial arts movie actors do you have a favorite in that camp? Oh goodness! Oh, uh, you'll have to uh, you have to help me out with this one because everything like fighting is kind of synonymous with the movies as I watch them. So let's see, we got ja- I don't, Jackie Chan, don't, we got like you okay. know, Chuck Norris, and yeah. some of the old school guys. I think I like Jackie Chan a lot. You know, it just you know super fast, you know, highly creative with all the choreography in the movies. And from everything I've seen of him, I've never met him. Um, but every interview, he always just seems like a very uh, fun, entertaining, you know, l- loving life kind of guy. And that's like, how do you not love that guy? So, <laughs> so probably right. Jackie Chan. He's a great guy. We did a profile of him on one of our Thursday episodes, and I'll, I'll link to that in the show notes. And for anybody that's new, uh, we keep all those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. But yeah, he's a he's a really talented guy. I mean, he's a he's a singer and and just an overall entertainer on top of being a martial artist. And so there's, there's some good stuff going on there. I, I was afraid you were going to say Keanu Reeves and I wasn't going to let you get away with that. <laughs> uh, Keanu's cool, but for different reasons. But I, I remember this one thing in an outtake, I forget which Jackie Chan movie it was, but apparently he, I think he was jumping on a hovercraft and he broke his, he broke his foot or his leg and they weren't done shooting. So they, they put a cast and I, and they put a sock on the cast. So it looks like a sh- his shoe and he's still out there doing his own stunts. I mean, that's just, that's like toughness right there. <laughs> like I, you, you, I'm, you break your leg and you continue shooting. Right. And he's known for breaking something in just about every movie he does. And if I, if my memory is serving me and I'll check, I'm pretty sure that's super cop. And it probably was. So, and uh, I was like, oh, so like, so martial artist creative and he's tough. Like, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And it's easy to forget that he's, getting older now he's far older than what most martial arts um actors and really i mean because he does all his own stunt work you know so you can think of him as a uh, stunt double too yeah you know there aren't too many stunt doubles working at his age (laughs) (laughs) imagine be trying to be a stunt double for that guy like you know like you get that call we need you to be a stunt double for uh for jackie chan you're like i don't know (laughs) No, I'm out. I'm out because he'll do just about anything. Yeah. If he's not doing it, then I'm uh, I'm probably just going to die. How about books? Any martial arts or, or you know loosely related books you'd it, tell us about? You know, it's almost uh, almost embarrassing to say, but you know, I read voraciously. But it's usually you know news or technical stuff. I don't read a whole lot of uh, 
fiction or old martial arts books to I mean to be perfectly honest usually i'm when i'm learning about martial arts and things like that it's like right off youtube or so, or you know some videos or something like that not too many old, you know old martial arts books okay well i mean youtube youtube can work i mean for for some similar reasons depending on you know what people are trying to get out of books versus trying to get out of youtube are there youtube channels that you might recommend oh uh yeah uh what is it uh submissions 101 i don't think is like um but i don't think there's any one particular channel usually i'm like i'll look for a counter and escape a different kind of submission from it uh, from one um there's that there's an instructor in a, a black belt jujitsu black belt in uh in san francisco i really like and he has a submission of the week his name is kurt osiander a uh, really rough guy tough guy but you know certainly super cool i visit him in san francisco every time i'm there um, and he does a move of the week. It's kind of, you know, it's, it's a lot of times it's jujitsu. It's very slow. It's very heavy, very simple and highly effective. And that's uh, the, the style that I prefer. So I've gone back and I've researched his moves of the week, you know, a hundred times. And that's one of the things I found interesting about, uh, I don't know about if, it, if the same thing happens in other martial arts, but in Brazilian jujitsu, I've gone back and I've relearned re-looked at the details in certain moves or even certain fights and saw it in a completely different way. You know, years ago, I was not skilled enough to see the nuances and the details of the move or the fight. And now I see, I just see the sequence in a completely different way. So I've had to review all my knowledge from past years. And now I take away something completely different. Like, yes, I know how to do an arm bar. Yes, I know how to do a rear naked choke. But when you relearn it and you redo it and you go through it with another high level black belt and they're teaching you details, you'll t get a completely different experience with it. And, uh, and he's one of those guys. Nice. Nice. And that, that's something that I remember just before... I earned my first black belt. Uh, the senior student in my karate school uh, was having a conversation with me, and I said, "You know, what was it like getting your black belt?" And he said, "I realized how much I didn't know." And that's always really stuck with me. And and for for similar reasons for what you're talking about, that you know, you learn a certain amount of knowledge, and then you go back and realize how much more there is to know on the detail level. Yeah, you know, so uh, yeah, I, I earned a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and. Uh, you know, I think, you know, the, there's not too many belts in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Blue belt, I kind of figure it's, uh, if when you earn a blue belt, it's you've learned how to tap. <laughs> um, <laughs> a purple belt is kind of somebody that can connect moves together. Brown belt, they've introduced some, some strategy. And when you get to black belt, yes, you're very experienced, but you end up being more of an encyclopedia of moves and everything else. And, anything else. and then, you know, I, I can just say for myself, I've learned probably more as a black belt than I've done than I did all the other years combined leading up to a black, you know, being a black belt. It's kind of, it's kind of interesting. I, I, I should have enjoy, enjoyed the journey more, you know, from one belt to the next and early not looked forward to the next belt so much. That's a, that's a one problem with a black belt. There's no more belts after it, you know, not for, you know, you might get a red and black belt 35 years later, but it's like, you know, there's no more belts, which is a kind of, for me, it was a good thing. I don't have to worry about the belts or the stripes or anything like that. I can just focus on the game. Um, on the art, and, uh, and it's probably helped help me out a lot, just giving me less to think about. Mm. So are you saying that the motivation for your training has changed? Were you really belt-driven before? It's, it's, it's uh, yeah, I think, to be honest, yes, I probably was at least a little bit. Yes, I, of course, I wanted to get better, but getting promoted, I think for a lot of students, is a big, it's a big part of their training and reason why they come back. They want to get to the next level, the next belt, and not necessarily the next level of skill. And so now that I, when I go to the academy, I'm not thinking about a stripe. I'm not thinking about my belt. I'm, more, I'm just thinking about what I need to focus on. So it, it just, it just frees me up from that kind of obligation. So as mu much as I really, I, I never knew I was going to be a black belt one day. It just kind of, it just kind of happened. It's still very much in the back of my mind. And I, I probably should have just enjoyed the journey much more. Sure. And the way I asked that question was, was almost a trick because I wanted to see what you would say, because yeah, it, it's human nature. The majority of us are going to want that external representation of our commitment of our, hopefully our knowledge and our investment into the martial arts. But f most of us, I'd say, not all, I certainly know people on both sides, get to a point where rank doesn't matter so much. Now it's about, okay, I want to get better. As, as you said, I want to 
I want to focus on my training. It's it's especially true, uh, in, I think, in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu because it does not look good when a black belt gets tapped out by a blue belt. You know, it doesn't I mean it happens from time to time, and, <laughs> um, but a black belt shouldn't be able to like really you know, a, you know, in a sparring match, in a general sparring match, lose to a blue belt. I mean, they should the, the skill differential should be such to an extent that it shouldn't happen. So, uh, you know, those guys in our academy definitely keep me training because they're really good. <laughs> nice. Nice. Have you – now you've trained for long enough that Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu has really gone from being kind of a, a fringe martial art to something that's really prominent. Have you noticed a change in the type of people coming in wanting to learn? It's just a lot more, I think. Um, so I think I got started when Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu was just on the – you know the, uh, UFC was still, you know, in its adolescent years, still very new, and I, and I started then, and I kind of saw the rise of it. I got it. I got probably got in it at the same time as many many other people uh, got into it. I just kind of stuck with it. Um, but one of the things I noticed just over the years, because again I travel a lot, is every city and every town I go to has at least one, if not several, martial arts places that I can jump into and just start taking classes, and they're always very welcoming. But I have noticed that there is a distinct difference in the in the in the gyms and the culture. You know, a lot of places will train Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and general grappling. MMA places versus you know Jiu Jitsu academies. I tend to, because of my style of training, I tend to go for the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu classes that they wear the the gis and the belts and things like that versus the MMA places where they're doing generally a no gi and rash guards. Wow. Yeah, it's you know it's it's something that I would like to go back and spend some time with again the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu because I know that my my ground game so to speak could use some work. But yeah, I'm I'm really enjoying the perspective that you're that you're you're bringing in because it it is different and because of that tie with with BJJ and and the mixed martial arts world I think you're you're giving a lot of us that don't train in what you do some different things to, to think about. I, th well, I think, you know, in, Bra in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu classes where they wear the gi, you know, it's a, it's a very standard class format. You you do some warm-ups, you learn a move or two, you do drills, and then you spend anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes sparring. That's a, And that's a general class. And the, the gi gives you, you know, it's kind of like judo. It gives you something to hold on to. There's a ton more moves when you have a gi on, you know, different submissions that you can do because you're using the gi as a defense item but also as a weapon. Um, but it's, you know, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu as a martial art, it's very respectful. It's very programmatic in that way. And it's, you know, people in there for the love of the art, necess not necessarily to get tough and to beat other people up. It's different when you go to the general uh, MMA school. And this is not true across the board. But a lot of times the MMA schools where they, you know, they might have good instructors and I'm, they're very skilled. But it seemed to me that they, a lot of times they have something to prove. Like, you know, they, they have, they have to, they're treating every fight as if it's a world title fight, you know, that sort of thing. And, you know, he gets more injury prone. And Nogi does, is meant to simulate cage fighting. There's nothing really to grab onto. There's no... There's no gi or anything like that. It's kind of like a, a slip and go kind of art. So the the style of fighting changed a little bit. Um, so I'll I'll do both. I grab you know I'm proficient in both, but I just prefer the the gi style of fighting because it's something I can train hard, but also train safe without running the risk of you know, people with attitude problems. Mm, yeah. Have you? It, would you say that? I'm going to ask this in a diplomatic way because I'm not in your world, but I have, but I hear things about your world, right? So uh, this is a good opportunity for me to, to bounce these questions off somebody. Has the, has that attitude increased? Is there, is there more of a incidence of that now than there was say five, 10 years ago? Uh, difficult to say, cause I think it really depends on the academy and the instructor itself. So when I walk into a cat an academy, you know, it, you know, let's say it's a gi academy. I'll just look very closely at, how, you know, from the fr the front door person. Are they welcoming? Um, do they want me there? Are they looking at me curiously? Are they looking at me like fresh meat, somebody to test their skills on that sort of thing? Or are they very welcoming? Ninety nine a jujitsu place. Ninety nine times out of hundred, everybody's extremely welcoming. They want to know who you are, where you're from, who you train with, and what they're looking. For, what they're 
I'm looking at it from their eyes. It's almost like an opportunity for them to learn something new from you and also to test themselves a little bit, not in a in a bad way. They just want to, you know, they, they only get to train with their own style of jujitsu a lot of times, and they like the opportunity to train with other people in kind of like a, a, a closed, you know, less stressful setting. So universally, I've always been extremely welcome in the Brazilian jiu-jitsu academies by the instructor. But the other thing I'm looking for is not only the quality in the instructor, but his, their attentiveness. Are they attentive to the class? Are they really taking the time to teach the students? Are they watching every single match and every single move being done and making sure no, nothing gets heated out of control? Because that actually, I think, what separates the, the good academies from the great academies is the attentiveness and the passion of the instructor. If the instructor is right, is right there very watchful and controlling the action the whole time, that's a really good academy. And I think you could make that same statement about a lot of other things, certainly other martial arts schools, other styles. I think that certainly applies. Well, we're training fighting. So anytime people get a little out of control or somebody isn't telling them to settle down and teach them the right way, the right etiquette, people are going to get hurt. And so, you know, yeah. people that have to go to work the next day. So, you know, so unless the instructor's right there, right there at all times, making sure everything goes okay and spreading that culture out, you know, when you do that, things are going to go great. When, when the instructor is not attentive, I've seen it several times, things go sideways really fast and that's never a good outcome. So let's roll back a little bit. Let's see if I can put you on that spot for who you would want to train with. I think, is it train with or fight? I'll let you answer both. <laughs> fight wasn't on the list, but, but I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let you put in both. Um, I think in a fight, I, I, when I was thinking about it, like I think what has been billed, at least for many, many years, is one of the greatest, if not the greatest fighter of all time, is Muhammad Ali. You know, still today, people equate boxing with fighting. I don't. Boxing is boxing. Fighting is fighting most. And MMA is the closest simulation of that that we have while still allowing you the ability to fight again. I would like to fight, not in a boxing match, in a fight, Muhammad Ali, I think. You know, especially in his prime to think like how, you know, the greatest fighter of his day, how does it compare against an average fighter of today? How does that look? And I think not only his skill at the time, his persona, but I also like to meet that guy when he had all his when he had all his faculties way back then, when he was you know saying all those crazy things way back the, way back then. I think that's a person that whether you love him or hate him at the time would be a really interesting character to mix it up with. Mm, I agree. <laughs> now, how about training? How about let, let's say it learning under? Maybe maybe that would be. Uh, you know, it's kind of in a way I was thinking about like, who would I, I, I just recently got to do it, but I would love to have been able to train with uh, Hicks and Gracie in his day and come up uh, and come up that way. Because at back then, he was definitely billed as one of the, the best, if not the best Brazilian Jiu Jitsu guys ever, really, you know, super strong, you know, flexible, fast, skilled, you know a good temperament about him just, you know, did it his whole life and be able to learn from somebody like that would be pretty phenomenal. Interestingly, vicariously, I've actually gotten to do that. So one recently is I actually didn't get to train with them personally, but I took a class from Hicks and Gracie. I actually got to train uh, a, a couple of classes with uh, his son, Cron Gracie, who's just phenomenal guy, but he's extremely skilled. But I got to sit with Hicks in a while, and I asked him questions about different positions and move, and he moves, and he took the time with uh, me and my brother to teach us some stuff. So that was amazing. Coincidentally, um, Hicks and Gracie gave a black belt to my current my my instructor Luis Heredia is I think his first if not one of his first black belts. So I actually have the Hicks and Gracie lineage going through my training now. I just would like to have trained with Hicks and Gracie back when he was in his twenties or thirties. Wow, cool. Yeah, um, I've certainly heard a ton of good stuff, and you know the the Gracie family name. I mean that's that's Brazilian Jiu Jitsu royalty right there. So. Yeah. Okay. Now, how about goals? Most of us are goal-driven, especially martial artists. What is it that's keeping you going? What's keeping you training and learning and getting better? I think, uh, you know, 
it, it's, it's, it almost sounds superficial in a way, but I think right now at this stage of my life, I want to get as, I'm, I'm on a, my goal is to get as fit as humanly possible, to get as strong, fast, you know, just as physically fit as humanly possible. And uh, I really dislike the, the conventional form of exercise, whether it's running or jumping rope and bicycling. I prefer martial arts. I prefer sports and things like that. Yes, I'll do some weight training and things like that. But I think in many ways my, that my physical fitness goals, you know, matches with uh, martial arts or Brazilian jiu-jitsu. That's one of them. But when it comes to martial arts itself, I actually, I don't, in my mind, I really don't have any goals with it. My, my goal is to go there, have fun, and to learn. I want to be the best version of myself for lack of a better way every time i train i want to get a little bit better every single time and now i'm just enjoying the journey of brazilian jiu-jitsu and mar and martial arts and in the meantime getting in great shape is definitely attractive you know you kind of downplayed it but i think that is the goal i think that's the best goal to go to have fun to learn to get better to get in shape i mean that's that's 99% of it for 99% of us. Yeah, I mean, I, I think before maybe I should have a goal of being world champion or, or winning a tournament or something like that. Yes, I'll go compete um, once or twice a year. Um, but I just want to get better. That's it. I want to go there, have fun, test myself, challenge myself, and, and that's it. And, and I think if I did that, you know, for the next 15, 20 years, I'd, nothing would make me happier. Awesome. I don't so much think it's important what your goal is, but that you know what it is and that it, it drives you, it fuels you. So perfect. Now, here's a chance we, we throw some kind of commercial time your way and you can use this however you want. You know, you've got conferences and, you know, what, whatever your business, you know, if you <laughs> want to talk about that, you know, it doesn't just have to be martial arts stuff. But if people want to get a hold of you or learn more about you and what you do with these two very distinct sides of your life, how would they do that? Uh, I'm pretty active on uh, email or social media. So uh, my email address is me, M-E, at jeremiahgrossman.com. So uh, I was fortunate enough to get the dot .com on my own name. Um, let's see here. And on social media, or at least on Twitter, uh, Jeremiah G on Twitter. I'm pretty active on Twitter. Um, unless you're into hacking and computer security stuff, you can follow if you choose, but I'll only scare, I'll only scare you to death with the things that I tweet about. <laughs> and uh, then on Facebook, I'm um, Jeremiah Grossman on, on Facebook, and that's all fine. That's, so I keep you know my social media uh, accounts kind of separate. So on Facebook, I'm just Jeremiah Grossman. I go to the beach, and I live on Maui, and I do martial arts and stuff. And then on Twitter, I'm you know Jeremiah, the, the executive professional hacker type. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's important to have that distinction and, and to, to have a voice with your social media, whatever it is, we, we do that a little bit. Well, I, you know, I, I do have a personal life from my friends and family because I live in Hawaii, right? And they don't, they don't know Jeremiah, the professional hacker, that's the martial artist. So they, if they want to just follow that part, no problem, Facebook and everybody else gets to follow me on Twitter. There you go. That works. And of course, we'll, we'll link to those things over on the show notes page, which make it easier for everybody. So, and before we wrap up, do you have any parting advice for everyone listening? I guess if you're into martial arts, into martial arts, getting into martial arts, the, the thing that I've always learned is the thing that we touched on earlier. Just have fun with it. You know, if you have something to improve, nothing wrong with that. But, you know, have, you know, whether your goals are just, just have fun with it, you know, select some good training partners, challenge yourself, get to that next plateau, but have fun. It can't only be about the destination. You have, as it's been said, you have to embrace the grind. And if, if you, if you're not embracing the grind, then you're just marking days. Life is short, you know, do something that makes you happy where the goal is going to be, is going to be that much better at the end. Thank you for listening to episode 74 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and thank you to Mr. Grossman. Head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for the show notes, a video of Muhammad Ali fighting a mixed martial arts from the 70s, outtakes from Rumble in the Bronx, and some other things we talked about during the show. If you like the show, make sure you're subscribing or using one of our custom apps. They're available on iOS and Android. For those of you kind enough to leave us a review, we randomly check out the different podcast review sites, and if we find your review and mention it on the air, be sure to email us for your free box of Whistlekick stuff. If you know someone that would be a great interview for the show, please fill out the form at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com 
Or if you just want to shoot us a message with a suggestion for a Thursday show or some other feedback, there's a place to do that on the website as well. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, pretty much everywhere you can think of. And the username is always Whistlekick. Remember the products you can find at whistlekick.com, like our durable, comfortable, better designed sparring gloves. But that's all for today. So until next episode, train hard, smile, and have a great day.